Hello, it's Mr. Willis, <coughs> Biology, section 32.2 and 32.3 today, talking about the muscles and the bones. Absolutely. So first we'll talk about bones, we didn't get a chance to do that yesterday, we did watch a little movie about it, hopefully you read about it. If you didn't, you can have a chance to read about it tonight. Here are all the bones in the body. I happen to have a skeleton up here. Whoa. This skeleton has a name. Fred. Fred. You know why we call it Fred? Is Fred Rica. Fred Rica. Um, basically, you have your uh, your your cranium, the uh, the bones of the skull and the face. There's 22 of them. And they've kind of grown together, you see, over the formation. 22 bones. And if you ever take a, an anatomy class in college or maybe in high school, if we ever offer that, you will uh, have to learn all these names of the bones. But anyway. So we don't have to know all the bone names? No, you won't have to know the bone names for this test. Didn't we have to learn something for you? Do we have to know, like, the, Wait, the bones in the axial skull? Yeah, I'll tell you what that is in a minute. This is the, so this is the cranium, listen, this is your backbone, there's a number of vertebra, vertebrae bones, they're basically sort of like copies of one another, and there's a whole bunch of them, and of course you have your ribs here, in the front you have your sternum, and connecting the sternum to the ribs there's cartilage, this clear stuff right here is cartilage that's softer and allows a little bit more movement. So, your skull and your ribs and your vertebrae, that's all kind of in the middle of the skeleton. We call that the axial skeleton. You can think of the axis of a wheel as kind of in the middle. The axial skeleton is in the middle of the body. And then attached to the axial skeleton are the appendages. Appendages are things sticking off the main body, like arms and legs. So we call that the appendicular skeleton. So we have the clavicles here. Those are your uh, those are your shoulder blades. Collar bones. You have there. I mean your collarbones. The yeah. scapula. Jeez. Those are your shoulder blades. You have your humerus. Is your upper arm bone. Is all your let, who's doing this? Let, can I do it? The uh, the radius and ulna are your lower arm bones. You got your carpals, which are uh, a collection of eight bones right here in your wrist. Metacarpals. Your metacarpals are uh, these bones that are in the palm of your hand, right in here. And these finger bones are called phalanges. And each finger actually has three bones. Um, your thumb has two. The proximal, middle, and distal phalanx is what they're called. Whoa. And then you have your, your, uh, your hips here. There are actually three bones that are fused together. And uh, they're called the coxal bones. And then you have the biggest bone in the body is this one, it's the femur, large oh, upper the leg bone. Isn't it the strongest bone? Uh, probably is, yeah, it's probably the strongest too, the biggest. Then you got your, uh, your kneecap here, that's called your patella. Your shin is your tibia, and the little one next to it is the fibula. A lot of people call that the fibia, that's incorrect, it's the fibula. And then there's your tarsals, are these foot bones kind of in the back of your foot, and the metatarsals are kind of in the front of your foot, and then you have your phalanges again, which are uh, three bones per toe, except for the big toe, which has two bones. So anyway, those are all the different bones of the body, and uh, if you count them all up, there's 206 of them. There's actually, some people have extra bones, uh, some people have a couple extra ribs that stick out below these two little ones here. And some people have four extra ribs. Nice. So it could be 206, 208, 210, somewhere around there, it depends on the person. We call those vestigial organs, by the way, really small bones that have disappeared in some people. Yes? When you get shin splints, is it which bone is The muscles it? It's the tibia the muscles right here. Away from the yeah. Yeah. Yep, I yes, have Grant? My uncle has four extra rib bones. Does he? Yeah. A lot of people do. Which ones are the ones right here? Because I know I can pop mine. This? Coxal bone? No, no, in my ribs. Ribs? 
Yeah. These right here. You yeah, can pop them. Like, Our ribs are pretty strong. Pretty strong. Oh, jeez. I've been picked up my ribs oh. before. By what? I've been picked up. Oh, God. Oh, you're still pretty strong. You don't see that with your bone. Okay. If you take a bone, listen. If you take a bone and you cut it open and you look inside of it, you see an open space. It's called the marrow cavity. Now, some bones have what we call red marrow. I have red marrow. Listen. Sorry. I'll try to be quiet so we can get through this. Red marrow is, uh, is what makes your blood cells. Um, blood cells are made in the bone marrow. You've probably heard of people getting bone marrow transplants. And often the, the cells in the bone marrow are messed up. They're multiplying out of control. That's a type of cancer called leukemia. And you, often, you, you can pull out, or, or there's other problems with bone marrow, but you can pull out your bone marrow and put new bone marrow in from somebody else. It's called a bone marrow transplant. Isn't that extremely painful? Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's a big operation. Yeah, let's not do that. Now, a lot of your bones don't have red marrow. They have what's called yellow marrow, and that contains fat. Bennett. Isn't marrow like, really healthy for you to eat? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of cells in there, so it's a lot of nutrition. If you, if, uh, there's some animals like hyenas that just live off bone marrow. They go find a skeleton that lions have killed or something, and their teeth are strong enough to break through the bones where lions do. Yeah, is that what the dogs like? Yeah, if the bones cut out, then they'll suck on the marrow. If you look at the bone under a microscope, there are cells arranged in circles. Like a tree trunk. Which uh, looks like if, if you cut down a tree, every black dot there is a little area where there was a cell living. And the black dot there has a name. It's called a lacuna. And that's where the cell lives. Lacuna means coffin in Latin. And it looked as... Uh, first experimenters that looked at this like they were a bunch of little coffins. So that's what they called them. Um, we call the whole bone arrangement an osteon. And there's a cell inside a lacuna. We call it an osteocyte. Osteo means bone, site means cell. So there's a bone cell. Uh, Drew, are you pointed at this? Uh, yeah. You look like you're still at the skillet. It's on both of them at the same time. And here we get, have an arrangement here where there's a bone cut open and uh, you can see this area of the bone, which is the outside of the bone, we call that compact bone. And you can see these osteon, these arrangements of circles like I just showed you, circles of cells. But on the inside, near the inside of the bone, as you get toward the bone marrow, it becomes spongy bone. Spongy bone is areas where there's a bunch of little holes, and that makes the bone lighter. If your entire skeletal system was compact bone, you'd be about 30 or 40 pounds heavier than you are. But having this spongy bone in various areas of the bone makes it a lot lighter because you get these open spaces. Notice there's blood vessels and nerves running through the bone itself. Bones are living tissues with living cells, so they need blood. And the nerves allow the bones to feel. If you break a bone, you're breaking those nerves. It hurts really bad. And here it shows you the healing that can go on. And that's what the video yesterday was about. The girl that uh, broke her arm. There are cells that crawl around called osteoblasts that make new bone tissue. So when the bone breaks, osteoblasts crawl around and lay down new bone. And there are cells called osteoclasts, and it's easy to get the two confused. Osteoblasts make new bone, osteoclasts break down your bone. So you have cells crawling around your bones right now, breaking them down, wow. and cells crawling around laying down new bone, and that keeps your bones fresh. Your bones are never more than a few months old, even though you might be... If you're 80, 90 years old, you're still, your bones kind of replace themselves, and that keeps them from, from getting messed up and worn down. Fragile? Yes, Allegrace. Um, the other day when we were watching the film or whatever, and she yeah. had, like, 
the big clump of bone at yeah. first? Are the osteoblasts the things that ate away the extra The bone? osteoblasts lay down the oh, new the bone and form the big bump. The osteoclasts break it down and reshape it so it's so it's the normal shape. Yes. What is osteo mode like? Osteos. In the movie, it showed like this animal that this cell like it was, and it it was it go through and break up the bone. Osteoclast. Question. The girl who broke her arm like. No, it gets the osteoclast break it down to make it back to normal. Yes. Yeah, a little bit stronger probably in the area where it was because it remains a little bit wider, and that's that's basically the body saying, okay, here's a place where we might get breaks. Let's make it a little stronger there. Yeah. If you break your arm once and then it heals and then you break it again, will it heal or will it? Yeah, it it'll re heal even if you break it again. Once I do. Okay, hey, 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 don't make the extra comments. Yes. Why would people break their, uh, like, I have a friend of mine who broke his arm once, like, when he was in eighth grade. He's broken like 12 times since then. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know. Does it make the bone weaker after you break no, it? No, usually it's stronger. It's stronger. So that's, that's odd. Maybe he's got some, some problem in that area. Maybe it doesn't heal right. Okay. Bones have hinges, joints we call them, uh, places where there's movement between the bones. That's, this is called a hinge joint. Um, that's kind of a simple joint. There's other joints right here. It's called a ball and socket. The ones in the skull are called sutures. They don't allow much movement at all. And so there's different types of areas where bones join one another. We call those joints. Baby soft spots on the back of their head, is that because the suture had formed? Hasn't formed yet, that's exactly right. I have a soft spot on my head. Hinge joint, gliding joint, sutures. There's the back of the head suture that forms last. That's where the soft spot would be. Those three bones do not grow together until you're uh, a few years old. This is what bone looks like when uh, you have what's called osteoporosis. For some reason, in older women, it usually happens in women, and, and scientists aren't exactly sure why, the bones tend to uh, uh, lose their calcium and did not, not replace the calcium fast enough. So the calcium in the bones wears down, the bone becomes brittle, and the person will often uh, break bones easily. Question, Graham. Is that why like, old people break their bones so easily? Yeah. Just, like, and the, uh, you, you often hear about uh, old people breaking their hips. Oh, yeah. And you often hear, she broke her hip in the shower. And what happens is, and a lot of people end up dying from this, you, uh, if you step and put all your weight on one leg like this, all the weight is basically pushing on, ends up when you lean over and you're standing like this, it, all your weight goes on to this part of the femur. It's called the neck of the femur, right there, the neck of this ball and socket joint. And what happens is when old people step up into the shower, they have to step over the edge of the tub and getting in like that is just too much weight. If they have osteoporosis, it breaks that neck and they fall. And so often you hear, oh, she fell in the shower. Well, what happened is it broke, then she fell. And the reason why it often breaks there is because the, the area of the bone is osteoporotic. What they'll do is often do what's called a hip replacement. And they do a surgery where they go in and this, this will not, in an old person, it will never heal if that breaks. And so they go in and they cut the bone, they saw it off right there, and they put a big metal piece right here that looks exactly like that. And that's called a hip replacement. Nope. And often they have to put a metal piece here too to hold the, sock, the ball and socket. And that metal piece will last forever. The problem is it's such a huge surgery, there's often when you're old, you don't heal fast from surgeries. You're, you're in bed for a long amount of time. A lot of people don't make it through that. Yes? 
Um, why did people like, in that picture like the way you kind of have like yeah, that's when when the bones become osteoporotic like that, you can no longer hold yourself up. Your bones are just not strong enough. So they, they start to lean over a lot instead of your bones kind of giving you support in your muscles. You become bent over. You have to help hold yourself up with the strollers. Would it yes. be, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but would it be smart if like before you get old, because you said a lot of old people don't like feel fast. Yes. Would it be smart to like, is that hip replacement before? Probably not, because it doesn't happen in, in that many people. Uh, it does happen. But the, the And it's a big operation. You don't want to do unnecessary operations. That would probably end up killing more people than it would help. But it would be smart to replace the calcium. Mm -hmm. And you say drink a lot of milk. A lot of old people do what's called calcium supplements. And we know that exercising helps your muscles suck the calcium up to make them look more like that. So exercising... Taking calcium supplements, that's what you need to do. Okay, let's watch a quick video that I know you'll be interested in. The man with the lost hand. What if you lost your hand? Wouldn't that be bad? Not always bad. Watch. Usually. And reattach the machine room. Wait, start it over. Quiet, please. It's a warm July evening. Paramedics are frantically trying to stabilize a young man whose hand was severed on the rooftop of a skyscraper. His hand was sliced off by a huge industrial fan and flung 17 stories toward the ground where it disappeared into the night. Rescue workers break into two teams. The fire department stays behind to hunt for the missing limb while paramedics rush the victim to the hospital. A news crew covering the story joins in the search. Time is critical if there's any hope of reattaching a severed hand. The limb must be found quickly and delivered to the surgeons. Amazingly, nearly 30 minutes after the accident, it's the news cameraman who stumbles upon the lost hand, lying in a gutter 150 feet away, and 17 stories down from where the accident occurred. The hand, which had been run over by a car, is carried by a paramedic to an ambulance. The hand is watched packed in ice, and rapidly transported to the hospital. A team of surgeons immediately goes to work. Because the hand has been crushed by a car, it makes reattachment extremely difficult. In a delicate eight-hour operation, doctors reattach the hand and miraculously restore much of its use. Today, thanks to the quick thinking of the paramedics and exhaustive search by the news crew, the incident made medical history as the only time a hand was lost, found, and reattached. Yeah, I want to see the guy. Oh, well, how do you get, like, stuck there? But it's in there. Show the other one. Okay, I'll show the other one at the end here. Because it's even more exciting. Let's first talk about muscles. Page 947. Turn to 947. Now, muscles help move the body, or they cause the movement of the body, they are attached to the bone. And the muscles, what they do is uh, they are able to contract. And contract means shorten. You have a muscle, for instance, sitting right here on top of the humerus called the biceps muscle. And this biceps muscle has the ability, with your brain, you can send a message to the muscle and tell the muscle to shorten. And see, the muscle sits right here where my fist is, and part of it attaches down here to the, uh, part of it, I'm sorry, it sits right here, the muscle does, part of it is attached to the shoulder blade right there, and the other part is attached to the radius right there. And when this muscle shortens, it pulls on this bone down here, because part of it's attached here, and pulls it up. And so if I'm going to raise my hand, I just send a message from my brain to the biceps muscle. The biceps muscle contracts, and I'll show you how that contraction works, and pulls the arm up. Yes? Um, is that really? So like when a cramp happens, is that? The muscle, muscle contracted, really? fully contracted, and it won't stop. And I'll show you why that is. Too. I torn my biceps. Now, muscles actually come in three types. 
Smooth cardiac up here, Bennett. Skeletal. Smooth muscle is muscle that surrounds your organs in your body. And for instance, I told you that your blood vessels were surrounded by muscle that can squeeze the blood vessels tight. And your digestive system is surrounded by muscles that squeeze the food along. This smooth muscle moves, squeezes very slowly. And you can't control it with your brain. You can't think, you can't say, okay, squeeze the food along, I want to digest faster. It's all subconscious. It's, you can't control it by thinking. Skeletal muscle fiber is muscle that you can see. The muscles in your body, if you say make a muscle, that's skeletal muscle. And all of that you can control consciously. You, you can say, okay, I'm going to move my arm and it'll move. I'm going to run and, it'll, and you'll, you'll move your leg muscles. So skeletal muscles are the ones attached to your bones that you can see. Smooth muscles are the muscles around your internal organs like your digestive system and blood vessels that you can't really see and you can't control by thinking. And then cardiac muscle, that's heart muscle. Your heart is a big muscle that has kind of special cells and we call that cardiac muscle. And you can't control your heart just by thinking either. You can't say slow down heart or speed up heart. There actually are uh, one in a million people that can do that. They have a cross wiring connection in their brain and they can control their heart. And they train as ninjas and can slow down their heart rate. Like me. I use ninja focus to slow down my heart rate. Ninja focus. No, but you were dead. Now, you can see the muscles here work in pairs. We call them antagonistic pairs. The muscle on the top, the biceps, contracts and pulls the arm up. The muscle on the bottom, the triceps, contracts and pulls it down. There's always a pair of muscles for each motion. So up and down, there's a pair of muscles, that two muscles that can do that motion back and forth. There's two muscles that can pull your finger up and back. There's two muscles that pull your wrist up and back. There's different, two different muscles that pull it one sideways and another. So if you combine the work of all these different muscles, you can do complicated movements. But you have to send the message from your brain to the muscles at exactly the right time to do all your movements. If you're doing something really complicated, like throwing a baseball, it probably requires the exact movement of about 60 or 70 different muscles. You have over 650 muscles in the body. And the brain has to send the messages to exactly the right muscle at exactly the right time to get the perfect throw. So it takes a lot of practice to be able to throw the ball straight. You can watch a person who's never thrown, or try it yourself with your left hand if you're right-handed. It doesn't look coordinated. The ball doesn't go where you want it to every time. If you've practiced it a lot, it goes exactly where you want it to. The coordination takes a lot of practice. And so, uh, the muscle, the muscular system is, is very complex, getting all those muscles to work correctly. Just learning to walk, it took you months and months of practice. You don't remember it, but what, that's what you did most of your life from age one to age two, is you practiced trying to walk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Video footage. Whether you are playing tennis, pushing a lawnmower, or riding, some muscles contract while others relax as the action is performed. When the biceps muscle contracts, the lower arm is moved upward. The triceps are relaxed. When the triceps muscle on the back of the upper arm contracts, the lower arm moves downward. The biceps are relaxed. Now. The question some of you may be wondering is how does a muscle contract? There must be some mechanism that allows it to contract. It's not magic. How does it work? Well, here's where it gets kind of complicated. And the book goes into several paragraphs trying to describe this to you, starting on page 948. 949, there's a special National Geographic reading section that you need to make sure you look at on this. And I'm going to give, it, give you the short version of this. 
Here is a muscle cell. A muscle cell is called a muscle fiber. And muscle cells are real long. They run the entire length of your muscles. And there's millions of them. And if you look inside the muscle cell, you see these red circles. And if you look up close at a red circle, you see that it's made of two types of proteins. A protein called actin, which are real thin proteins that look like little wires, and a protein called myosin that's a thick protein. And the myosin and actin, I don't know if you can tell by looking at this, but they overlap with one another, like this. Here's actin, here's myosin, they're kind of overlapped. And what happens when a muscle contract it, contracts is, these proteins move past one another, like that slide together. And so it's this, it's this sliding of these protein filaments across one another that makes us call muscle contraction the sliding filament theory. And so you can see my two thumbs are getting closer together as I slide my fingers past one another. That's how muscle contraction works. And I'm going to show this to you what exactly happens, it's best explained through a video here. Take a look here. Word impulses arrive at the... And this is a boring guy talking, so I'm going to turn his, that voice off and let me talk through it. Here is a muscle cell. Listen, pay attention here. This will get you a lot of questions on this next test. Here's a muscle cell also known as muscle fiber. Here are the little red circles of actin and myosin proteins that are overlapping one another. This is a nerve sending signals, this yellow thing. It's called, it's called a neuron, and we'll talk more about the nervous system later. But here comes this electrical signal coming up, and it passes into the muscle cell. You can see the red lines going up into the muscle cell. And let's get a close-up of this area, shall we? Okay, thank you. And here comes the, the red signal. This is an electrical signal that's coming from the brain. Listen. And these yellow things that you see, that's calcium. Calcium is very important to getting muscles working. That's why the bones are made of calcium. It's stored in the bones, so if the muscles need it, the bones leak a little calcium out into the muscles. So these yellow balls you see coming out of this blue area are calcium atoms. And so here we go. You see calcium atoms leaking out of this blue area. Calcium atoms will go down deep into the muscle cell. And here we see a calcium atom attach to a special protein. Now, I'm, you're not going to have to worry about the names of these proteins. AP Biology has to do that. You're lucky you don't have to worry about it. This is the actin protein is the blue, and the myosin is the red. Now, remember I told you the actin and myosin overlapped with one another? Don't do that. The actin and myosin are overlapped with one another. They will slide past one another. Once again, this is myosin down here. This is actin here, and this little thing is like an oar on a boat. If any of y'all row crew, this is like an oar in, from a crew boat. And you'll see that this thing will reach up and grab the actin and pull it. Watch as this happens. Once again, the calcium comes in, attaches, it causes this protein to move, and now this Myosin, what we call a myosin cross pitch, can reach up and grab and pull. Watch it pull. A couple molecules come flying off. Pull. Pull. Here we go. Ah. Yeah, there we go. Pull. And ATP, you remember ATP, the energy molecule comes in and makes it detach and pull again. And so look at all these things are, are attaching and pulling, and the actin is sliding sliding past the myosin because it's being pulled. And that's what causes the movement here that causes the contraction. Now that's just, it's just going to go over the whole event again. 
But I want to show you another video that will sum it all together. And I got to move this up some. Whoops, make it bigger. And move it forward a bit. This shows you what happens when this is happening in, in a bunch of different areas. Okay, here we go. This is showing you the same thing the other video was showing you, except instead of this way, it's turned this way. The blue is the actin, the red is the myosin, and the little thing sticking off here, those little cross, those little auras we call cross bridges that reach out and grab, and watch this thing move, the whole muscle contract. These molecules interweave with others lined up facing them. See how they slide past? The fiber shortens when the individual pink molecules pull against blue arms that interweave among them. When the blue molecules are as close as possible to each other, the muscle is fully contracted. This can produce an overall shortening of 50% or so in a muscle, like the biceps. So if you want to contract your biceps, you send a nerve signal from the brain, it goes to the biceps muscle, calcium slides down onto this actin, and that allows these special places, it's called binding sites, to open up so these little arms, that's a little arm, can reach up and grab and pull, and pull these things close together to one another. Isn't that neat? That's how muscle contraction works. And they show that whole thing and they talk about it in the book. But if you don't see it in motion, it's really hard to understand. So yeah. since the body only uses part of the muscle's power to, to not rip it off the bone, and it, like adrenaline makes it use more of the muscle, that's what I think. That it to adrenaline, like you only use one third of the okay. amount that you can. So okay. how does it use it more in response to the adrenaline? I think the adrenaline gives more ATP to those cross bridges. So it's not moving. It makes them move, maybe move faster. That's a good question. I don't know. You use like one third because yeah. it's more of your top of them. I know that one of the effects of adrenaline is to cause muscle cells right. to make more ATP. So maybe the more ATP makes it pull faster or, or pay them pull more. Okay? So read the section on muscles and bones tonight. And now we got to see the long-awaited video, the man with the backward hand. Yes, his hand is backwards. Be glad your hand is forward. Our next video contains a shocking medical first, the one and only man with the backwards hand. In the rolling countryside of Tennessee lives a man who holds a very special place in the world of medical wonders. He's Wilson Collins, age 56. He lives in Arthur, Tennessee. He's the only person in the world with his right hand attached to his left arm. At first glance, when you see Wilson Collins' right hand sitting backwards on his left arm, it just doesn't look real. It defies all sense of reason and logic. But when you see him use his backwards hand for the first time, you can't help but admire his strength, courage, and determination. It's a miracle that he can do the things he does. I've had people stare, and I've had people come up and ask me, want to know what happened to you. And I tell them. Wilson wasn't born this way. His life changed in an instant. The year was 1981. He and his wife Linda were raising two young children in a small Tennessee mining town. The family was looking forward to Christmas, which was five days away. Wilson was at work pumping gas into a 50-ton truck when the driver accidentally backed up his rig, pinning Wilson to the ground and crushing his arms. And the truck, well, he, he got my arm, my right arm, caught under his wheel, and he just pulled that, all that meat right off of it down to the right hand. They rolled me over on my back. And I raised his hand up like this. And I see he was gone. He 
his right arm was ripped out of its socket, and his left hand and forearm were shattered beyond recognition. He was rushed to the emergency room. His wife recalls seeing his twisted limbs for the first time. This hand that was tangled up, it was turned all the way, and the thumb was on top, or, you know, or none of your hand would be on top, and it was white as cotton. And I started crying, he's going to die. As doctors fought to save his life, they also searched for a way to restore his limbs. His right arm was mangled beyond repair, but amazingly, his right hand was in perfect condition. On the left side of his body, his left hand was totally destroyed, but his left arm was untouched. Doctors came up with the radical idea to attach the good right hand to the good left arm. They labored for 15 hours in an intricate microscopic world, reattaching blood vessels, nerves, muscles, and tendons, all backwards. And when it was done, Wilson had made medical history. He had a right hand attached to his left arm. Now the question, would it work? Everyone watched and waited to see if this strangely transplanted hand could possibly function. I'd say for about a year, he depended so hardly on me and the two kids. We were his rock. We did things for him. It took time, but within a year, he slowly began to regain movement. Then came the challenge of learning how to use it. I know that I'd get better. I couldn't sit there all my life. Because, of course, a dead hand. Wilson endured years of painful physical therapy, struggling to master the most simple everyday tasks, which he once took for granted. Now he's reached an independence he never thought possible. He owes it all to the surgeons who came up with the shocking idea to push the envelope of modern medical science by performing the world's only backwards hand transplant. It's a miracle from God. He wanted me to have the right knee and I got the right knee. Die with the camera? Bro. Why wouldn't they just move this stuff? Hold on. What's that? Now, the last thing, listen, the last thing the book talks about is fast, fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. You may have heard of that before. Slow twitch muscle fibers have more endurance than fast twitch fibers. And they have myoglobin. Myoglobin is a, is a molecule that holds oxygen. So slow twitch fibers don't get tired. Yes? Your uh, camera's about to die. Okay, I'll get it right, right now. Fast twitch fibers, they move real quick. And they don't have myoglobin in them.